for most of my life, and I know for many of you also, I've been involved with teams of groups. None of us are an island unto ourselves, even though sometimes we may try to be. But we all, we're always a part of a group, whether it be at business and in the, in the teams that we're on, in our profession or whatever it may be at work, at school, we certainly participate. And I have been in a former life, being a, a teacher and a coach for many years. I've been associated with many teams, been fortunate to be a part of a lot of great teams with, with coaches and players. But every, every team that I've ever been a part of, what was always true is, was a saying that many of you are familiar with, that anything with two heads is a freak. You can't have but one leader. You can't have, you've got to have one chief and then the Indians to follow, or the leader and the followers. And with, I can remember in, in a coaching aspect of always telling players to know your role. Even with leaders, they have to know their role. We have to know our role. And so we all have a role to play. We all have to, and, and many times when a team or a body or a group doesn't function well, it's because people don't know their role. Everybody is not the person or the face out front. Everyone can't do what everyone else can do. We have different abilities and different talents. And you, you probably sitting in church on Sunday morning know where we're headed with this, but that certainly applies to the church. We are gifted differently. We, we have been granted different gifts, and we're going to look at this more in the, in the coming weeks than we will this morning. But, we, but the, the key thing about the church is that there are not two heads. There is one head, and it is Jesus Christ. And that is why the invisible church, the real church, the universal church for all eternity, however you want to say that, but the real church that will live forever with our God, that is the most effective body in the history of the world because it is led by God, by God Almighty. And He will see His purposes through. Now the, now the visible church that we see and that is part of the world where you have people who really are not a part who really have not been supernaturally changed. Now, it has many problems because it's made up, even with people that have been changed, like you and I, with sinful people that still struggle with sin. But ultimately, we're going to see in the end that the church sets out and accomplishes the exact purposes that God planned for it to do. And that is a great comfort, folks. And we, we're going to see this as Paul hails this truth as we finish this last portion of the first part of chapter 4. In chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 today, two things that he's going to reveal. Is he brings, we, we know that this is divided into verses 1 through 6, and then 7 through 10, and then 11 through 16 where Paul is talking about the unity of the church. And we're going to conclude this first portion today in verses 5 and 6. And he reveals two fundamental truths for us as he brings this to a conclusion. Number one, that God is sovereign over the unity of the church. Not just the church, but the unity of it that Paul has been talking about. And number two, that he is sovereign over all. And now while we know that, and that sounds like elementary 101, those have very deep and abiding uh, meanings that they overlap together, which is important for us to see as Paul brings this out. So if you would join with me, you can follow along or listen as I read aloud from Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read the context of this, verses 1 through 6, as we have been the last few weeks, and we'll be concluding that today. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of God. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Join me as we pray, as we enter this portion of our worship this morning. Father, we come to you again, as we have many times already this morning, corporately, God, and certainly individually, praying for this body, praying for this gathering this morning, God, praying for what we are offering to you, and that is worship, that we are not performing or trying to please man, but we are offering worship to you as you have commanded us to do as a body of believers that are joined together in the bond of peace with that unity that is performed by you, God. And we give you great thanks for that. And we pray now, Lord, that as we enter into this where we focus solely on your word, we pray that you would Holy Spirit, that you would guide us, that, that that power in us would give us discernment, that what is said would be correct and right, that it would be made simple to understand and, and comprehend, and that it would be in accordance with your will. And most of all, God, that it would glorify you, that the spiritual realm would know that we are worshiping you, God, that we declare that you are God Almighty, the great Jehovah, the Lion of Judah, the Prince of Peace, wonderful Counselor, everlasting God, and there is no other. And that is why we are here this morning, Father, so that we might worship you together and that there would be no doubt who we claim to be God. Father, I pray that these words that have been here since the dawn of time and continue to last through eternity, as we have sung about, that they will pierce our hearts, that they will encourage us, that they would admonish us, that they would bring us together even more with each other, but especially with you in our relationship with you, God, and that you might be glorified through this. And we pray this in the matchless name of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. We come to this looking at these two truths that Paul gives us in these last two verses of this first section of chapter 4. The, that God, His sovereignty over the unity of the church, that ultimately He is the one that brings that about, and also His, His, His sovereignty over everything which all that ties together is important for us. First, one thing that one theologian points out is don't let all these ones get in the way here. Where, where Paul is listening, if you go back to the beginning where he's uh, in verse 2, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And then he talks about the specifics of the unity in the Spirit. There is one body, one Spirit, and then he has one of his digressions that, the, that is set off in print with hyphens. It's not a, as long one like chapter 3, but it is a short one like chapter 2 of Ephesians. But he says, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. We talked about this last week, about the call and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And then he picks up with his ones, the one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Don't get caught up, and we're not going to take time. Those are pretty self-explanatory, who God is, who the Father is, who the Spirit is. But what I want you to see is where he mentions one Lord. Remember the context and the time frame that this was written. And this is something, this is just kind of an aside that, that joins these together. Not only is God sovereign over the church, he's sovereign over all creation. He's sovereign over everything going on in the world right now. And we talk about, we've mentioned this a lot on Wednesday nights during our equip time and talk about some specific things that are challenges to the Christian faith. And we have mentioned this on Sunday morning too. And it, we mention a lot because our world, especially the culture that we live in, not just the global earth, but the culture that we live, is fastly changing. It is going in opposition to God, and we're going to be increasingly different. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. That's God's plan. 
But some of us, your pastor included, don't like to stand out. We don't like to be different. We want to be liked. We want to be accepted. And when we stand on God's world in this culture, we're not going to be liked many times. We're not going to be accepted many times. We're going to be seen as kooks many times. When we call back ancient words of old from the dawn of time and say we still believe them because they're the Word of God. They're not just a history book. And so that is, that's one thing that, the, that many commentators bring out about this passage. That one Lord, Paul, that is an offensive passage when Paul wrote this because they're in the Roman Empire. And Paul's in prison already because he won't bow the knee to Caesar as he writes this letter that he has claimed that there is one God, one Lord, and he's not, calling, he's not bringing out Nero. He doesn't mention Nero. He doesn't tell anybody to bow the knee to Nero. Now, then we come to the problem, just a point of application. If we go to Romans 13 and other passages in the New Testament, it tells us that God has placed government in place in the world, in civilization, as a blessing to us that they seek out wrong and punish it. That they, that they keep order so that we don't have just complete rioting and anarchy, which is a total absence of government. And then we see government being used as a tool for corruption, being used as a tool for evil many times. Today, in our present world, but certainly we can go through history, we can go to the Roman Empire when this actual letter was written around 55, 60 A.D., it was corrupt as corrupt could be. And we still live in that corruption, sometimes even more of it. But that government we must be subject to. And how do we, how do we walk that line? How do, we, how do we do that balancing act? We have some very good application in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel. In chapter 3, there are three gentlemen there that Daniel brings out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are told that by, by Nebuchadnezzar that when the horn blows, they must bow their knee and they must stop what they're doing and they must worship only him. And they refuse to do that. Now, they're, they're Jews in exile. They're in captivity. But yet they are still worshiping their God. They're still practicing the disciplines of their faith. And they've been called out on it by other of the office holders. And they want the king to punish them and put them to death. And what does he say? He says, all right, they have denied my sovereignty. We're going to put them in the fiery furnace. And we're going to throw them up there. And it's heated 70 times hotter. It just means it is, you couldn't even be, the people that were near the furnace, their hair was singed. They weren't even in the fire yet. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know this story. They go into the furnace, they're thrown in, and what does Nebuchadnezzar see? He sees a fourth person. They're walking around in the fire in the furnace. Now, some say this is a Christophany, an appearance, before an appearance of Christ before He came to flesh. Whatever it was, it was the presence of God there with them. It was some type of presence of God with those three men. And they came out of the furnace and their hair, they didn't even smell like smoke. I can open a door or a window in the last few nights and smell smoke in the air from chimneys around me that are burning. Because it's a powerful smell. And a furnace that was heated so hot that the people that put them in were singed and incinerated immediately. And they went in the furnace and were saved. And Nebuchadnezzar realizes that they worship the one true God. Again, a few chapters later in Daniel 6, Daniel's called out because he is worshiping God three times a day. He's kneeling and praying to God three times a day, as was his practice. And the jealous other office holders told the king about this and said, well, you need to make a call where you, where you sound the noise and everybody has to kneel and bow to you. And Daniel didn't do it. He was bowing to God. What happens to Daniel? 
He's put in the lion's den with a lion that hadn't eaten in many days. And what does God do with that lion? He closes his mouth. And Daniel sits in the lion's den all night and comes out the next morning and he's, he's still there. He and the lions are buds because of the power of God. Folks, this is what we must to understand. Yes, there's going to be cost when we follow Christ. There's going to be cost when we stand on the Word of God. Because this is not what our culture, this is not what the world, this, for people who do not know God, they, do, they are certainly not going to bow their knee to Him. They are certainly not going to worship Him. And they're not going to tolerate those that do. Now, we're not being persecuted. Sure, there's some inconvenience for us. Nobody held you at gunpoint to get here this morning. Nobody called and threatened your life if you attended worship this morning. That's happening all up, at many places around the world. And it may be the case here one day. But my point is this. While there is cost in the here and now, God is sovereign and He will take care of His children. As the old proverb says, for a believer, there are worse things than death. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We go home for eternity. That is a great thing. Sure, people behind grieve and we leave loved ones behind and they grieve and, they, and we know that. Those of us that have experienced that, which is probably all of us, the loss of a loved one. I, but I want to make this, this point, folks, because this is important application. Government is a gift from God. We are to be in subjection to it. But we do not violate, we do not violate the principles of Scripture that we have been commanded to obey. Now, there may be differences of opinion. And we don't fall in line with what conventional wisdom is because it makes us popular. Or because so we can seem like we're in the cool kids group and sit at the right table at lunch break. That peer pressure continues to grow as adults, does it not? And we must stand on the principles of the Word of God that all of these ones that it talks about, there is one Lord, and He is controlling even those in opposition to Him. He is controlling them. He's using them as pawns, just like He did Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus, to punish His people, to bring His children into captivity because of their disobedience. So God is at work in everything that is going on. But we, we must honor Him and we must honor the rules that are around us in our society, but ultimately Him. And then lastly, how Paul brings us out that He is sovereign of all. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith. He continues that one baptism. That is the unity of our faith, of our belief, of what we hold to. One God and Father of all, and here it is, who is over all and through all and in all. That is who we worship, folks. I, I, I know for me, I've shared this, I share it many times on Sunday night when we're in a smaller, more informal group or on Wednesday night. But when I read Scripture each day, there are things that I know I've read before and they just penetrate me because I've, I, I've already violated them before I sat down to read Scripture. One for that recently has been Psalm 34. I've read Psalm 34 many, many times in reading through the Psalms. But verse 1 says, His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my lips. And sometimes I've already, His praise has not been on my lips in the first hour of the morning because the weather is not what I wanted it to be. Or because there's been an inconvenient change in my schedule because of a text I get or an email or phone call. I, I feel like a complete failure when I'm reminded of that. And I am a failure in that sense, but ultimately just as we read during the pastoral prayer from Hebrews 5, 
I have not been constantly training myself like I should by God's Word. And folks, this is what I want us to understand. Regardless of what news flash or what bulletin comes up on your phone, your news alert of something else that Congress has done or some politician has done or some presidential candidate has done or some group has done or what the city organizers have organized and going to allow a march to do. All those things that infuriate us. We must remember that God is in control. That not only is He sovereign over us that are His children, not only is He sovereign over this body, the bride of Christ, around the world, but He is sovereign over everything that is going on in this world. He is not only part of it, He's not only seeing it, He has ordained it, as hard as that is to understand many times. And He is orchestrating things. He is using sin and sinners. He's not causing evil, don't misunderstand me, but He is using sin and sinners to bring about His purposes because sin has entered mankind in the garden in Genesis 3. And that is being reconciled individually as God brings people to faith in Jesus Christ when He causes us to be born again. But our culture of, boy, I liked it better in the good old days, is not being redeemed. It's not going to be redeemed. And the good old days were not that, old, that good. They were filled up with sin too. Another time period, another this, another that. God is redeeming a people. And He is going to work out His purposes. And I want this to be an encouragement to us. I want it to be peace to us because that's the intention of it. That's what Paul is writing there. Just as he writes at the beginning, at the outset of Ephesians in verse 22 in chapter 1. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him His head over all things to the church. That's talking about Jesus Christ. Not only do we have one God and Father in all and above all and involved in everything, He has transferred that to God the Son. And we are His bride. And He is working all this out. As one of our men has prayed this morning, He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty right now. And He is interceding for us. He is our advocate. And when we fall down, when we sin, what do we learn in the study of gentle and lowly? He's saying, come here, for I am gentle and lowly. I'm not sitting here with a lightning bolt because you're my child and going to blow you up and all of a sudden you're no longer a part of my family. That doesn't happen in God's family. He is continuing to draw us to Him as Paul is going to show us in the following verses in the next few weeks. This is so important to understand, folks, because it changes how we live. It changes what we understand. And here here is the key to this. It causes us, just like I mentioned with Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless Him at all times. His praise is continually on my lips. Regardless of our circumstances, regardless of how we feel physically, regardless of the challenges that we're dealing with, that that can be the life we lead through Jesus Christ, through Christ in us through the power that is in us. And as he says, there is one one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Just like Paul at the end of that doctrine of salvation in chapters 1 through 11, especially 9, 10, 11 at the end of chapter 11, in the last verse, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Folks, I want myself as your pastor and your brother in Christ, and I want you as the family of Green Pond Baptist Church. I want us to understand what the power of Paul is writing right here. That's why we're taking our time going through this, because there's so much depth and there's so much wisdom that we can apply to our lives. And if the, the key to this is that the more we understand this and the power of God, 
the more we will strive to live for His glory and His obedience. Our access to the sovereignty of God is in Jesus Christ. And it allows God's perfect plan to be worked out through the church. You hear that? You are the peace. You you have the ministry of reconciliation that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. You are the, the, the mouthpiece in all the people you come in contact with to give the message of peace, of reconciliation. That all of humanity can be right with God. That is, that is a free offer of salvation. And it is our job. We certainly don't save anybody. We don't control that. The gospel saves people when God awakens them to it. But they can't be awakened until they hear it until it is spoken to them, until it is articulated to it. The old adage, and it's a real cool thing, and people love it, preach a sermon every day, use words as necessary. Well, I take issue with that. Words have to be spoken. Words are, they have to be articulated according to Romans 10, 17. The words of Christ is how people come to Christ. Not by how cool you look doing something, or how sweet you look. Now, that might be a passageway where you can speak the gospel. But it doesn't happen by actions. It happens by the word of Christ. The gospel. And this is what draws us closer and closer to him. The theologian I mentioned many times this series, Frank Thelman from V.C. Divinity School, New Testament scholar there, especially with Ephesians. He says this about this ending of this section in, in Ephesians 4. There is only one God who created all things. And is summing, He is summing them up in Christ. And He is the object of worship of all of Paul's readers. Because who are Paul's readers? The church. This isn't written to the lost world. It's written to the church. All of Paul's readers. If Paul's readers are unified, listen to this. This is convicting. If Paul's readers are unified with one another in their willingness to confess these truths then they should be willing to engage in the practical attitudes and actions that foster the unity of the church for which Christ died. That's our responsibility, folks. We know the truth. We've been given the truth through the revelation of Jesus Christ, through the revelation of God Himself. And if we take those and apply those to ourselves and to our body, we will do nothing but continue that bond of peace and the spirit of unity that the Spirit has held for us. And that it will be different. We will look different individually and collectively to a lost world. And that is what we should be. That is what we should look like. I'll close with this, going back to Ephesians, the first chapter. That beautiful ending. Remember verses 3 through 14? Remember that in chapter 1, one sentence where Paul has that in the, in the original Greek, it's one sentence, and the last portion of that. In Him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ, remember there He's talking to whom? He's talking to the Jews. Because remember, He's, he's leading up to this Jew and Gentile thing. Being, being reconciled with one God, to Him who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of His glory. And then verse 13, he says, In Him you also, he's talking to the Gentiles, to us, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Folks, that is good news. Your salvation and my salvation, if God has called you out, if God has truly called you into relationship with Him, it has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And then he continues, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Until we leave this earth and leave this realm and are with God forever and we had the full glorification of His salvation that He has granted us. What a glorious day that will be. What a marvelous God we serve, folks. 
I go back, as I go back to myself many times, as John says in his letter to the church, if we love him, we will keep his commandment. And his commandments are not burdensome. If you find yourself constantly, or if I find myself constantly struggling to obey God in everything and just, I don't want to do that, then we probably need to pray and check our heart. Because His commandments are not burdensome. We have been given a new spirit. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus if we have been born again. And that is a work of God. And we're not going to do that perfectly. But when we do and as we do it, as we are training ourselves each day, that we can be glorified in the fact, we can share God's glory in the fact and encourage ourselves that He is working out His will and His way even when we don't understand it. And we need to look to see how we can glorify Him in hard circumstances and the challenges in the tests that are coming. And we can help each other do that because we have a God that has given us each other while we are going through this through this hardship of this world. Pray with me. Lord, we, we live in a world and in a system and a culture that of course You know is growing increasingly different from You. God, we have power struggles in many parts of our life. Many times because they're a result of sin. In marriages, there are power struggles about who should be the head. In families, there are power struggles between parent and child about who should be the head, who should be the leader. In businesses and other organizations that we're a part of, we have so many confrontations about who's in leadership. God, we give you thanks that in your church, we know that the leader is Jesus Christ our Lord that He is the unmistakable head that You have put in charge, that we are His bride, and that You have created us for His glory. What an amazing thing. What an amazing God we have in You, Lord. And we pray, Father, that just the simple truth that You are one God, one Father over all, and in all, and above all, and that you have manifested yourself in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ to us. Lord, that that will be enough that we can stand amazed and behold the glory of the King of kings and the Lord of lords to behold our God. We pray this in the name of the one who has saved us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.